Hey, good morning, North Haven. Thank you so much for being with us here today. Uh, my name is Pastor Adam, for those of you who don't know who I am, and I'm the senior pastor here at North Haven. And so I couldn't be more excited about what today is going to begin. Today, July 4th, 2021, begins our Christmas in July focus that we're gonna have over this entire month. And so each Sunday, we're going to be looking at Operation Christmas Child. Now, for a lot of you, when you hear Operation Christmas Child, you immediately begin thinking about what that is. And you're aware of the shoe boxes, and you maybe have been to a packing party or a packing experience, either at another church or here at North Haven. But Operation Christmas Child, for those of you who aren't aware, is an endeavor that happens all across the country where we pack shoe boxes full of hygiene items, school supplies, and toys, and other things that get sent out to kids all across the world, and specifically kids who don't have access to those things. And it's not just so that they can have school supplies, it's not just so that they can have hygiene items, or, or it's not just so that they can have toys and whatnot, uh, but it is so that they can hear in a tangible way and experience the good news of Jesus Christ. Because in each one of those shoe boxes is the message of the gospel and the message that each and every single one of these kids is dearly loved and pursued by their creator. And that love is personified so per perfectly in the death and resurrection of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And so this is just a fantastic endeavor and it's one that North Haven Church has embraced for a number of years. And you may have participated in any of our um, Operation Christmas Child packing experiences, but all those boxes need supplies. And so you see just a semblance of those supplies here behind me. These are, these are various items that are going to be eventually packed into these shoe boxes and that will be sent to kids all across all across the world and we want to invite you to be an active participant in that yes even in july so as i mentioned we're going to be unpacking what operation christmas child is our relationship as a church with operation christmas child and its impact uh, on on people on kids and communities families all across all across the world and we're going to do that in two specific, or rather three specific ways. The first is uh, we're going to hear stories of Operation Christmas Child and how it has impacted people's lives. The second thing is we're going to give you a tangible means of actually getting some of these supplies yourself. And so in your worship folder, you'll notice that there is a list of school supplies that we're asking you to go out and get sometime this month. And the third thing that we're gonna ask you to do is each box that, box that gets sent out to kids all across the world requires a certain amount of money in order to ship it. And that amount is $9. It costs $9 to send one of those boxes out. And so we're asking you, would you consider, would you even now consider praying about giving towards a box or two or three or four or five or 10? Pray about that, begin praying now. But Today is going to be a little different because I'm not in person with you here today. I wanted to give you the next best thing and that is a conversation that I had the privilege of having with an, a gentleman by the name of Eve. Now I first heard Eve's story last year when he came and spoke to a number of us uh, connected with Operation Christmas Child at North Haven. He shared his story and it's such a powerful testimony to the impact of Operation Christmas Child that I could not pass on the opportunity to share that with all of you. Without further ado, check out this conversation between Adam and Eve. All right. Well, um, Eve, thank you so much for joining me. And uh, I'm looking forward to spending this time and talking in a, to you about Operation Christmas Child. And, you know, you, you were with us last year. We had um, in the midst of COVID and all the craziness yeah. that that we were, well, I mean, we're kind of still in the midst of it, but we certainly were at that time. And you came and there was a group of us who heard you and your story. And um, I personally was just incredibly uh, blessed and encouraged, not only by your story, but by your heart and passion for the lost. 
and specifically then Operation Christmas Child's role mm-hmm. in yeah. sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so, you know, we are we're in the midst now. We're starting today our Christmas in July uh, uh, push in in hoping to. Uh, elevate and illuminate um, Operation Christmas Child, specifically here at North Haven Church. Hi, Adam. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, I am so excited to uh, to be here virtually. You know, <laughs> here. Uh, I wish I could be there in person, but this is the next best thing. Uh, I am honored to get to uh, witness the amazing work that all of you at the church are doing uh, through the ministry of Operation Christmas Child. My name is Eve Dushime. And when I was 11 years old, I received one of these red and green shoe boxes that so many of us have uh, come to know so come to know so well. Uh, I was living in the country of Togo uh, in West Africa, but that's not where I'm originally from. I'm originally from Rwanda, and uh, Rwanda is where my story begins. And we have to go way back to Rwanda to understand why this tiny little box has such a huge impact uh, on my life. Uh, I currently live in Buffalo, New York. Uh, you guys might know a little bit about, you know, the the, the frozen tundras uh, of the north. Uh, and uh, I serve, I've served, I've had the privilege, the greatest privilege of serving as a, as a spokesperson for Operation Christmas Child and Samaritan Spurs for the last seven seasons, seven years of my life. Yeah, and it is an honor, an honor truly to be here. Well, Eve, tell me, uh, so as I mentioned, you know, I, I, I've already had the benefit of hearing your personal story. You mentioned that you received one of these uh, red and green shoe boxes when you were a kid. Yeah. Can you tell us about that? Uh, you know, share that story, how you interacted with that and the impact it had in your life and your family. Yeah, you know, um, like I said, in order to understand why such a tiny little thing uh could have a profound impact on, on my life and, and, and uh, it, on my heart, I have to go way back to Rwanda. That's where my family's from. And I'm sure the moment I mentioned Rwanda, uh, many of you, your minds directly went to uh, the Rwandan genocide. You know, the single, uh, one of the worst atrocities to have ever befallen the history of humanity. And that is where my story begins in 1994. And in case you don't remember, uh, the Rwandan genocide was a um, was a power struggle, a conflict uh, sparked by a power struggle between two people groups, Hutus on one side and the Tutsis on the other. And you know, for generations, these two groups didn't they couldn't get along, but they always find ways to make it work. However, in 1994, the president's plane was shot down. The president was Hutu at the time, and um, there were suspicions that the people that shot down his plane were the Tutsi uh, rebels. And that was the single event, the single catalyst that led to the murder of one million people in the span of 100 days. Now, I'm sharing these details with you because among that million uh, were were my family members. I've never gotten the chance to meet my uh, my my uncles, my cousins, uh, uh, any of my grandfathers, any of my grandmothers, uh, of my extended family. I've ever met. I've only ever met my mom's little sister. Everyone else was uh, was slaughtered, killed for the crime of being born in an ethnic group uh, they never chose to be born into. And I'm sharing these things with you because I want you to understand the kind of mental state I grew up in as a kid. You know, as a kid in 1994, my family had to flee Rwanda um, in July of 1994. So they wouldn't, uh, so no harm would come to them. And at the time, my mom was eight months pregnant with me. So I was actually born on the road. Uh, My mom and my family had to walk two weeks and leave Rwanda uh, and eventually made it to Congo uh, where they they settled uh, next door in a a refugee camp. And when you think refugee camp, it wasn't anything established or official. It was just just an open space in the woods where they would go in uh, the woods and gather pieces of sticks, bury them in the ground, you know, four of them in each corner, find pieces of plastic, put them together, make the tarp and sleep in the dirt. And in that dirt is where I was born. And this is all super interesting because in the midst of all of this, I'm growing up in a Christian home. My parents are pastors. Okay. And almost on a daily basis, they're telling me, Eve, look, you got to 
you got to look beyond that and you got to love your, your neighbor as yourself. And I would often ask my, my, my dad, like, dad, I don't know how you can expect me to love the very people that killed your dad and your mom. I don't know how you can ask that of me. That was complete nonsense. Um, the hatred in my heart consumed every bit of who I was and I saw no way out. Um, until the year 2005, when we went to church, we were living in Togo at this point after traveling through so many different countries and we, uh, we moved around so much because uh, at the time, no country was welcoming well, uh, Rwandan refugees. They were saying, look, it was your people that killed one another. It was civilians that were killing civilians. We have no way of telling who was a murderer, who isn't. So we're not going to let any of you in. So essentially, we had to sneak into countries uh, as illegal immigrants because no one was taking us in, and we weren't going. We couldn't go back to Rwanda unless we wanted to to, to get to get to get killed. Um, so we lived in eight different countries and eventually made our way to to a place called Togo in the year two thousand and five. We went to church one day and they told us that someone somewhere had sent us these gifts uh, just out of nowhere. And we can get into more details uh, uh, further in. Uh, but I remember being handed a box that looked very much like this. And um, let me tell you, this thing has radically changed my life forever. Uh, it, it changed it those many years ago, but it continues to do so today. And I know some of you guys are probably looking around thinking, Eve, you just told us about this heavy, uh, hardened heart. How could school supplies, hygiene items, toys possibly have anything uh, to do with just any kind of redemption or healing? Well, let me tell you, when I opened up my shoebox at the very top, there was a sticky note, okay? And that sticky note read, God loves you. Jesus loves you. I love you. Now, I knew the first two things to be true because I heard it in church every week. I heard it in Sunday school. My parents had told me. But for the first time in my life, here I was faced with an I love you from a member of that very humanity that I had grown to despise and sworn to despise for the rest of my life. And they were telling me essentially, look, Eve, despite your hatred for me, dude, I love you anyway. And here's proof of my love for you in the form of the first and only gift you have ever received in your entire life. I am 11 years old. I have never received a single gift because of the level of poverty we grew up in. And here is a complete stranger sending me a box filled with the very, very items I desperately needed as a kid. Let me tell you, Adam, um, that sticky note just uh, erected me. It shook my world to the core. And um, to be honest, it was my least favorite item in my shoebox that day. <laughs> <laughs> I hated that thing because it, it, it convicted me. Mm. It challenged every previously held beliefs that I had in my heart that humanity was doomed. Um, and God began to use it um, uh, as a seed to gradually begin this work of, of healing in my heart. Of course, gradually, this didn't happen overnight. Uh, where he started to rid me of all that anger, of all that pain, of all that brokenness, and making some room, some space in my heart for, for love and compassion. And he did so simply by reminding me that um, if an ordinary man or a woman, boy or girl out there in the world, that I justified hating by calling them broken. If a broken man or a woman, boy or girl, could demonstrate this kind of tangible, powerful love towards me, then one, what was my excuse? Because I justified hating them because I said, look, these people are broken. I'm better than them. They don't deserve my attention, my love, my kindness. If they can do this to a total stranger, then one, what's my excuse? Mm -hmm. And two, if a broken member of this humanity could demonstrate this kind of love towards me, then how much greater must my father in heaven's love for me be? And that love has... Uh, rescued me from the burdens of hatred I carried with me all along. And um, I owe all of that to someone like you in the audience, uh, packing a simple shoebox and sending him wow. away. Wow. I don't know. Wow. Yeah, you, you mentioned that um, the box was full of items that you desperately needed. 
what what were those items and and what was the need? Yeah, you know, Togo is um, one of the poorest countries in the world. Okay, and when I say poor, um, I'm not talking America poor. <laughs> we have a we have a different kind of poverty in this country. Okay, I'm not saying there's no poverty. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying we have a different kind of poverty uh, in in this country. Um, in Togo, I grew up with kids who couldn't go to school simply because their families couldn't afford a pack of pencils. Mm. Okay. And I know that sounds insane. And just you can't wrap your mind around the fact that you can't afford a pack of pencils because um, you guys have the Dollar Tree, right? You, got, you have the Dollar I love the Dollar Tree. Uh, you, the, you know, we can go into the Dollar Tree, buy a pack of pencils for one dollar and be able to use it for, for the rest of the year. Better yet, uh, some of you guys uh, in the church, in the congregation could probably, um, some of you with younger kids or maybe with grandkids, you could probably go home and go in your living rooms, uh, go digging in your cot cushions and find enough school supplies to supply an entire school. How many of you guys know what I'm talking about? We have a different kind of poverty in this country. There is so much abundance here. And to put this into context, one American dollar is the equivalent of 540 plus of their currency. So affording a pack of pencil uh, pencils wasn't that simple. And here came this group of people we had never heard of um, in a community with so many kids who couldn't go to school. And they sent us 300 shoebox gifts and every single one of them had school supplies. Uh, almost overnight, the entire dynamic uh, in, in, in our village shifted because all of a sudden everyone could go to school. There was an abundance of school supplies. And, you know, my uh, my best friend growing up, his name was Romaric. Uh, he didn't go to school because uh, his family couldn't afford it. Uh, my, my parents sent us to school because uh, of missionaries that they had worked with. Um, I don't know if anyone has ever sponsored a kid and put them through school. That's how my siblings and I were put through school, uh, by the way. So thank you to anyone who has ever done that. Uh, my oldest brother is a doctor now. My second is uh, following brothers, finishing law school. And all of us have uh, have had the opportunity to, to, to reach our, our potential because of someone sponsoring us. So thank you if you've ever done that. But my friend Romaric had never had that privilege. And here he was in my village. I would go to school every day and come back. Uh, and there he was um, still, you know, just just playing around. And uh, on the day of the distribution, he didn't come to church, uh, but I had enough school supplies in, in my box to be able to share them with him. So I shared them with him. And for the first time in his life, he began to come to school uh, with me. And uh, Romanik is currently a software engineer in, in West Africa, in Ghana. He lives in Accra, Ghana, the tech hub of West Africa. Uh, the guy makes more money than I'll ever dream of in my entire life. And he lives in Africa. Okay. <laughs> and, you know, uh, once in a while I tell him, dude, where's my 10%, man? <laughs> uh, but, you know, this wealth, this, these blessings that God gave him by, you know, starting him with an education because of school supplies and a shoebox, he's able to use those to build clean water projects, to, 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 to fund academic programs and all these wonderful things in his community. And that is how just these tiny little things that we may not think about uh, can have such an, a profound, tangible, physical impact uh, on someone's life. A conversation that I have with many people about Operation Christmas Child is how, yes, a, a child will get that shoebox and obviously the items inside and that will uh, impact their lives. But the spread of that impact is much wider than just that child. Can you, can you talk yeah, yeah, about yeah. that? Yes, the ripple effects are certainly... Um, can certainly still be felt today in, in my community. I, I mentioned that where we lived, there were a lot of uh, witch doctors and like witchcraft followers. And uh, by the way, witchcraft is real. Anyone in the congregation didn't uh, know. Um, it's real because the devil is real, okay? And these witch doctors could 
could harness that power from the devil and be able to use it to heal just as much as to kill. Mm -hmm. And there is no, you know, oversight or accountability in these villages. The chief of the village, who usually was the witch doctor, uh, whatever he said went, whatever he did went, that was the end of it. Um, and when we moved into this place, uh, a pastor's family, like the witch doctor was like, look, you gotta, you gotta stay away from those people. Uh, the Christian folk are, are your enemy. You are not to be seen talking to them um, or hanging out with them or anything like that. And um, people obeyed. You know, they obeyed, and my dad was determined to, to, to share the gospel with anyone that he could, uh, because he would always say as kids that we were missionaries, which was really foreign to us, because we were like that. We, we're not here on purpose. <laughs> <laughs> you know, all the countries we would go to, he's like, yeah, we're missionaries in a new, in a new country now. We're like that. You're crazy. Uh, but I now know what he meant. You know, God had placed us in these communities so we could uh, have an impact, not only by uh, with the things we said and what we said, but in the way we lived. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the folks in the community were terrified to come to the church uh, until 2005, when they heard about these, these gifts that were coming and each and every single one of them had school supplies. And, all these families in, in this village were like, look, um, we have the opportunity to send our kids to school for the first time ever. And all we have to do is just break the rule for like an hour tops. We don't even have to talk to them. We just get in line, get a box, go home and give our kids an opportunity at a better future. And um, and I don't know about you or anyone listening who has kids, like they all chose their kids. For that brief hour on that Sunday, they were like, look, we're gonna risk it for our kids. And they went to church that day, to our church. As I, and as my father was looking was looking into this crowd that had gathered in our courtyard, he was like, we are never gonna get these people ever back here ever again. They're here for a gift, but let's give them the greatest gift that we have ever received. So he began to share the gospel for the first time in a community that had never heard uh, the name of Jesus spoken. I don't know if people are uh, tracking here, but for the first time ever, the gospel was pu publicly shared in a village that had been ravaged by witchcraft. And it was all possible because God used 300 of these things to break down barriers that had existed for generations and generations and allowed the gospel to be preached. Uh, in fact, um, you know, one of the crazy things that happened months later, because everyone that heard this, like, you know, we had this God so powerful, uh, yet so loving and forgiving that, uh, you know, not only we as believers, but they had the chance uh, of, of having eternal life, forgiveness, salvation, because God had sent his one and only son to die on a cross uh, for, for everyone, not us. Not just us, but they too. People couldn't be quiet about that. They had to go and they shared it. And those things, those words started spreading in the community. Even to people who were never present that day, they started hearing that they didn't have to cower to what the witch doctor said. They had a God who could fight for them so they could fight back too. And um, people started coming to church on Sundays, asking questions like, okay, how do I do this? How do I become this? How, how do I find this freedom? And about six months later or so, one of the most powerful witch doctors came to know Christ at our doorsteps, at our house, as a result of these whispers of the gospel that started spreading. And that coupled with him failing in a, in a, in a skill he had never felt that he tried to kill my dad and my family for so many times. And in his words, he said there was a powerful force that was fighting back that he didn't understand. So then when he started hearing about this powerful God who could, you know, uh, split the seas in two and set his people through. And he was like, well, I can't do that. And he would hear about this God who could um, feed thousands with just a couple of fish and loaves of bread. He was like, well, my people are starving and I can't do that. He would hear about this God who could raise people from the, from the dead. And he was like, oh, I can't do that. And story after story, 
Um, and coupled with his own defeat, and I think you never felt that. This man had never failed at killing people. Uh, he'd been, you know, he had the per this perfect record, if you will, until um, that powerful force that was explained by the gospel, the whispers that were spread in our community as a result of the shoebox distribution. Uh, but those were powerful, because when that, when that man came to know Christ, everything changed. Everyone was like, look, if that powerful man needs Jesus, so do we. In fact, uh, I love sharing his story because uh, almost overnight he became best friends with my dad. It was very strange for all of us, to be honest. He would drive by our house unannounced all the time. And at first sight, we we're like, oh, the witch doctor is here. But then we would remember, you know, he's on our side now. But he would drop by our house all the time unannounced, usually around dinner time. We kind of, my brothers and I caught on to the fact that maybe he liked my mom's cooking. <laughs> and one day he came to the house and he was like, Pastor Jean Baptiste, that's my father's name. Uh, Pastor Jean Baptiste, can you tell me more about this thing? He had given them a Bible and he was reading up about baptism. He's like, Can you tell me more about baptism? And my dad was like, um, yeah, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a public de declaration of faith. It's a symbolic dying to our old selves and, and our old sin and a renewal and a rebirth in Christ Jesus. And the man was like, well, am I eligible? And dad's like, of course you're eligible. So they set up a time and a date to go to the local river to baptize this man. And whenever they got there, this happened. It was uh, uh, an incredible just line of people that he had witnessed to and led to Christ. Like these people, the, the witch doctor had witnessed to, led to Christ and invited to be baptized alongside him. Yeah, all those people came to so, know Christ as a direct result. So let's, let's, let's backtrack here. So, so 300 boxes were sent to the area in which you and your, your family lived. Yes. And, um, 300 children were given boxes and that not only uh, contained school supplies, which enabled these 300 kids to be able to go to school for the first time. Ever. And more, more kids, more kids than that. Because they were able to distribute. <laughs> to share. Yeah. They just started sharing everything. Yeah. So more, more than that. And then, and then this started a ripple effect where the gospel was being whispered amongst the people, which then culminated in the leader of, of this community receiving Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior, which then prompted hundreds? Hundreds. hundreds. Villages over. In fact, three new churches were planted in my community as a, as a direct result of this witch doctor coming to know Christ. And uh, those churches... 300 boxes. 300 boxes. Three, yes, 300 boxes. Wow. Three new churches. And Pastor Adam, those churches are still standing to this very day. Wow. I get to chat with the, the uh, one of the people in that line is a deacon at the church, and we've grown really close over the years. We get to chat all the time, and he's a deacon at one of those churches, and he was baptized that day as a result of being witnessed to by a witch doctor who came to know Christ as a result of ripple effects from all the whispers uh, that started with what? Wow. 300 shoe boxes. That's yeah. amazing. That's, I mean, it's, incredible. Wow. it's, such, an, it's such a powerful testimony. You know, I, I, um, I, I can't help but do the numbers. Um, when I think, okay, so it, you know, it's 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 nine dollars to ship a shoe box. Um, three hundred boxes. That's twenty seven, two thousand seven hundred dollars, right? Did I do the math already? Pretty, yeah, yes. Two thousand yeah. seven. <laughs> yes. Two thousand seven hundred dollars to ensure that hundreds of people receive the knowledge of Jesus Christ. They're eating. Eternity is forever secure, and churches are established. Kids are going to school for the first time ever. I mean, that's just what a return, right? Mind boggling. You know, you and I have talked, and and uh, you know, one of the one of the difficulties with with any endeavor like this, um, and, and you know this living in Buffalo as well. So you have you have an individual or a family that lives here in Minnesota that, that is here at North Haven and um, they're obviously they're not in Togo they're not in India they're not seeing 
the immense ramifications, the immense um, uh, uh, return that comes from these shoot boxes uh, going into the hands of these kids all throughout the world. And it's easy, understandably, it's easy to go through the motions, right? To, uh, uh, to go and to pack a box, to put stuff into it and, and yeah. then hand it off to somebody and then maybe pat yourself on the back or feel like, okay, I did my Christmas duty of the year. You know, but how can, how can we better understand our role in this process? How can we better um, see our place in this grand story? Just the one shoebox. Like behind one is a whole human being. Yeah. Let, 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 let me rephrase that. If it were for that person that packed my shoebox in 2004, 2005, I wouldn't be the person I am today. My life was changed radically because one person packed one shoebox. Now, I don't know who they are, where they are. Um, if I did, I would fly to the ends of the earth to meet them and show them my gratitude. But that one person packed one shoebox that changed my life forever. And then in turn, allowing me to, to be able to um, share what God has done in my life uh, to others so they can be encouraged to do the same. Um, that person was the missionary in my life that God sent, that, that I needed to hear from. He or she is a missionary sent to my community uh, to change my heart. To those of you who have packed shoeboxes and, you know, sometimes felt like you got caught in, in, uh, in the emotions, just be reminded that you are literally a missionary uh, to a world that you will never or you may never set foot in. You can go if you want, but, uh, you know, you don't have to buy a plane ticket. You don't have to fly uh, to, to Togo, West Africa to make an impact, to be a missionary in the field. Just pack a shoebox. The shoebox will do it for you. And you will touch the life of uh, one child, potentially his or her family, or their community forever, simply by packing your shoebox in the comfort of your own home or at your own church. $9 to ship one box. So if we think about that, 300 boxes were delivered to Eve's community that one day that completely changed everything. 300 boxes that then cost $2,700 to ship. $2,700 was the cost in order to ensure that lives were forever changed. Not just one, not just five, not just 50, but hundreds of lives that were changed for the gospel. That is an amazing return as Eve mentioned. So here's the deal. We're gonna make it super easy for you to give $9 or 18 towards one, five, 10, 15, 20 boxes. And this is how we're gonna do it. You can certainly give you know, via check, you can give via cash, you can drop that in the offering um, as you leave the service here today. You can give that online just as we normally do or through the Church Center app. All those options are still there. But there's a new one that we're starting here today and it's gonna be available over the course of this month. All you gotta do is this, take out your smartphone and you're going to text this number. You text this number and in the, the, the place where you type your message, write OCC and then the dollar amount that you want to donate. If this is your first time connecting with Secure Give, it's just gonna take you through a brief uh, uh, sign-in process, it takes just a minute. If you've already connected with Secure Give, it is going to send that money like that. It's super easy, super convenient. We're going to remind you of it over the next few weeks. Um, but yes, text this number and write OCC and then the dollar amount that you would like to donate. And then that money will specifically go into Operation Christmas Child here at North Haven, ensuring that the boxes that we pack 
are able to be covered and then sent to these kids all across the world. So I couldn't be more excited about what God's going to do through this whole process. We're going to see the faithfulness of God's people realizing the call, understanding that you and I, we are missionaries in this process. And when we send a box, we know that we are sending the message of hope, the message of healing, the message of Jesus, and lives are going to be changed. Thank you for joining us, and I can't wait to see what God's going to do next.